Okay, so who is ready for the holidays? Uh, anybody have their Christmas tree already up? Anybody have this lady, Mariah Carey, stuck in their head already, of which it will be there for like the next two and a half months? All I want for Christmas. Oh, I can't even do it, right? Uh, I'm not sure when this entire Christmas starting immediately after Halloween started. I mean, that has happened in the stores for a long, long time. But it seems like more and more people are jumping onto this Halloween and then Christmas right there the very next day. Uh, there are Christmas lights up on my street, and I know friends that have Christmas trees up in their homes already. Uh, my kids are this way. Despite me, my children love, love, love Christmas. They are way into Christmas. As soon as November 1st happened, my daughter went and she pulled her Santa hat out and she's been wearing it to school every day since. And my son Sawyer, he never even stopped listening to Christmas songs. He was listening to them on the mountain bike race this summer. Um, I kind of like the idea of having Thanksgiving first and having a Thanksgiving season before all the hustle and bustle of Christmas. When I was a kid, I remember the holidays being this awesome time. Uh, we didn't live by my extended family. We didn't live by my cousins. And so during the holidays, we got to take these great big trips to go see all of my cousins and extended family. We'd go to my grandma's house or my aunt's house and, and we'd play games and we'd eat like so much food and we'd stay up late watching movies in the basement. I remember one Thanksgiving where the power went out on like half of my Aunt Jane's block. And so we had to go door to door to see who had power because all of the food was still in the oven. The turkey was half cooked. Everything was just half baked. After we figured out who had power, then we had to borrow enough extension cords to run like 10 extension cords from my aunt's kitchen all the way to her generous neighbor's house just to keep the food cooking. But then as an adult, for me, the holidays, they've become more and more complicated. Uh, I was married and divorced by the time I was 25 years old, and my oldest two kids are from my first marriage. One of the hardest parts of figuring out our custody agreement was what to do over the holidays. My ex-husband, Carl, his family, they celebrated Christmas on Christmas Eve. They went to church as late as they could and then opened presents until wee hours of the morning. Uh, my family, my family was a Christmas morning present family. So in order to accommodate both of our families, we came up with the most ridiculous custody schedule ever written into any agreement. My kids, they would be with Carl on Christmas Eve and do all the things with him and his family, and then I would pick them up at, get this, 2 a.m. I would pick up my kids at 2 a.m. on Christmas Day and take them home so that they could be in my house on Christmas morning. When I first agreed to do this, Chase was only about six years old, so I figured I only had to do it like 10 times before he could just drive himself and Mackenzie back home. It went pretty well for the first couple of years that we did this custody agreement. But then before long, I got married again. I married my husband, Ryan, and then we had our first child, Sawyer. Here's the thing with Ryan and I. Ryan and I are both firstborn kids in our families, so they were the first to try to navigate these complicated family expectations and then to kind of wreck them when it came to the holidays. We also had kids so much earlier than any of our siblings. Our first couple of Christmases together, we tried so hard to accommodate everybody, to please everybody. And so we would stay up really late and then we'd go pick up the kids at that 2 a.m. custody agreement time and bring them back to our house so that they could wake up in the morning and open the presents in our home. And then we would get dressed and we'd rush off to church with my family. So we'd make sure that we were worshiping there as soon as we opened presents. And then from church, we'd head over to my parents' house for lunch where my siblings were all gathered. And we'd open presents with them and my family and all those things. But then at about three o'clock, we'd cl drive clear across town over to his parents' house where his siblings were all gathered. And we'd open presents there. And at about 7 p.m., our kids were just melting from total and complete exhaustion. And, and honestly, I was too. But we'd push through to try and keep everybody happy. We'd go home at about 9 p.m., and the kids, they would fall asleep in the car, and then we'd carry them up to their bedrooms. I'd head back downstairs to make the coffee for the next day, and all I would see was just a house that was a disaster. Uh, dishes from breakfast still in the sink, wrapping paper still on the floor, presents that I spent so much time and energy getting 
totally unopened in the midst of all of our rush. I can remember collapsing at the end of Christmas on the couch with my husband Ryan and sitting there saying, oh my gosh, I hate Christmas so much. You see, holidays, they bring excitement and joy, but at the same time, for most of us, it also comes with all of these extra layers. Let's be honest, holidays are complicated. There are these complex layers of family, layers of expectation, layers of judgment, layers of stress, layers of tension, and sometimes layers of grief. If I didn't struggle with Christmas before, for me, the holidays in the last few years, they've taken on the, this heightened, more difficulty because of the time of the year. Uh, my mom's last Thanksgiving was spent at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where she was intubated and in a medically induced coma from her cancer treatments. And a couple of days later, she was out of the coma, and then she was walking again. And then a couple of weeks later, it was December 14th. And it was on that day that the doctors looked at her and my dad and said, you know what, there's nothing more that we can do. Kathy, you're only going to live another day or two, and uh, it's time to get all your family to come around. It was after that conversation that they shared that conversation with me and I was already in Rochester helping out with things for my mom. And so I had just learned that my mom was gonna die in the next day or two. And I remember walking around the hospital trying to find a cup of coffee so I could just keep going with this painful realization, this uh, terrible grief just swelling up in my whole body. And at the hospital, there were some carolers there, and they were trying to bring some ch Christmas cheer to the whole hospital, and they were singing the song, I'll Be Home for Christmas. It's when I heard those words that I just collapsed and crumbled on the floor. And my mom, my mom died the very next day. My kids know that when that song comes up on the playlist, all they do is yell, Alexa, skip. The holidays are complicated. They're complicated because they're wrapped in the midst of tradition and songs and smells and feelings. And some of it's great. And some of it's just really, really hard. It brings us all back to the holidays of the past and family and all of those things. It's all wrapped up in this obligation and expectation of this season. Maybe for you, you're like me, where there's this complicated layer of grief. You're missing somebody who isn't celebrating Christmas with you or Thanksgiving with you. Or maybe it's layers from your childhood. You get back together with your siblings and you find yourself all in the same place you were when you lived in that house together. You're back into those roles, repeating those same arguments you had your whole entire lives. Or maybe it's this layer of really deeply felt pressure. Like you feel like you're never going to be good enough for your dad or never going to be good enough for your mother-in-law. And so you just keep hustling and pushing to try and make everything perfect. Or maybe it's a layer of parental custody. If your family is anything like mine, it, which includes divorce, you're trying to figure out how to balance your side of the family and their side of the family, and it's so complicated, and you just want to try and accommodate everyone. Or maybe it's this layer of control. Maybe there's somebody, maybe it's you, who's always trying to control how the holidays show up, and you feel hostage and captive to it. Or maybe it's a layer of hiding. You don't feel like you can show up as your whole self to that family gathering. You're afraid that you're going to be judged. So there are parts of you that you feel like you have to hide. Or maybe it's a layer of trauma. Something so shameful that happened in the past that being around your family, it just triggers all of that for you immediately. Or maybe it's just like a layer of irritation. There's just some people in your family that you just don't plain like. <laughs> But it's true that as those layers, they build up one on top of each other, on top of each other, anyone else have layers in their families? We all do because families are complicated. So let's wonder this big question for us today. How do I survive the holidays? We're in our final week of our sermon series called Anything But Ordinary. And for these last couple of weeks, we've been taking a real honest look at our families, about how families are complicated because humans are complicated. And we all have these expectations of our families, both that we put out and that have been put on to us. We find ourselves hiding or, or trying to puff ourselves up in order to make ourselves matter. So today we're going to talk practically, very practically, about how do we show up for our families? How do we survive the holidays? 
There are all kinds of reasons that holidays are hard for so many of us, whether we're trying to please and impress everyone or we're working through some difficult childhood stuff or some difficult relationships in our lives. The holidays are hard because it's a lot. Uh, During the season, there are so many expectations. There are cards to order, mail and address, trees to put up and to decorate, turkeys to cook and pies to bake, presents to shop for for your family or for your kids, for your teachers, for your grandkids, for your colleagues, for your neighbors. Then there's family obligations and family drama. There's preparing and wrapping, trying to get your kids to have these really great memories or carrying through your partner through a difficult illness or struggle, wondering if this might be your last holiday with your beloved. There are so many things this time of year and we're all doing our best, but but here's the truth. No matter how much we hustle, no matter how much we give, our best will never be enough. I know my achievers out there, you just bristled a little bit. I get it, me too, I am an achiever. And I know that this statement is countercultural, but we get sold it a thousand times a day that if we just get our stuff together, then we'll find peace and happiness and balance and joy. Like if we can just do it all, do it all in our lifetime, there are 10 gadgets that are out there to help us or apps that we can get to get us more organized so that we can keep being the better and the best. But the reality is, is that there's always something new competing for your energy, your time, and your money. There's always another obligation or investment or meeting. There's always another expectation, event, or opportunity. But my friends, that is exactly why Jesus comes here in the midst of all this. This is exactly what Jesus frees us from. This is why Jesus said in the book of John, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is why we need Jesus. So here, here is your holiday survival guide. Number one, control what you can control. Jesus, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, he tells this whole big crowd gathered in front of him. He tells them, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? It's almost like Jesus is naming something that is so deeply rooted in our human existence, maybe even something that we're biologically predisposed to. You see, I think we think that worry keeps us safe, that worrying will keep us from harm, that if we work out all the future possible scenarios, that we'll be able to be prepared for the outcome, or even more, that we'll be able to control the outcome. If I worry about my body or my clothing or my food, then I can somehow protect myself. And we do this with our families all the time. We think and we overthink and we overthink again. We worry. We start to work out scenarios in our own heads like, oh my gosh, I hope that Uncle Denny doesn't bring up politics again because if he says this, then I'm going to say that. Or we start to think, uh, oh, all I've thought about all day is I hope that they really appreciate all the work that I have put into this meal. If they don't appreciate it, I think I'm just going to walk out of the room and, and storm myself out. Or we start to overthink like, oh, I hope that they like their present. Or, oh, what if the event is not perfect? What if going to judge me if I come out and tell them how I really feel. Before we know it, all this self-talk, all of this thinking and overthinking, all of this worry, before we know it, we're already pouring that third glass of Chardonnay or we're opening that fourth bush light just so we can slow down our anxious, worried brains. You see, like the crowd in Matthew 6, we think that we need to take care of all of these things by ourselves on our own. And we live into this fear, this fear of scarcity, this fear of brokenness, this fear of imperfection, this fear of being exposed, this fear of rejection, this fear of not measuring up, this fear of the turkey burning and there not being enough food. We have all these countless images of scarcity. And when we feel this fear, when we feel this scarcity, when our self-talk pours into it, we worry. And worry is our attempt to control the uncontrollable, to put control and trust in our own ability to satisfy our own desires and needs. Worry, uh, worrying about what we will wear or worrying about what we will eat or drink or how we're going to try to manhandle and hustle all of our own destiny and how we're going to try and control all the family people in our lives. So instead, Jesus teaches us, Jesus encourages us to only control what we can control. Number two on your holiday survival list is lower your expectations. 
Yeah, I know. I know that this seems countercultural because we live in a world that just seems to want to add more and more and more to your plate. But this one, this actually works for both your family and for your to-do list. My kids, they used to wait for their dad to show up and show up, and then they'd be heartbroken if he didn't. And instead of pumping them up or saying things like, oh, maybe he'll come next time, or um, at least the rest of your family was here at your event, it was better for us to just sit there and say, yeah, this stinks, but maybe it's not fair for us to expect that your dad's going to do what we want him to do. So what if we just love him for how he is? And that really took a lot of pressure off. It also means for your to-do list, like maybe this year you just don't get one of those things done. Maybe you don't bake gingerbread cookies or, or you don't go to the event that you would only go to just because you felt obligated to go to. Maybe you just leave one thing off of that list. Moms, this means maybe you lower your expectations and you accept that you're probably just going to get a robe for Christmas and that that's okay too. So number three on your holiday survival list is boundaries. Anything worth protecting in this world needs boundaries. I mean, think about it. If you want to protect your stuff, you put walls up around it. If you go and get a new puppy, you build a fence around your yard in order to keep that puppy in. If your teenager gets a cell phone, you want to protect them. You put some boundaries upon their cell phone use. If you go buy some expensive jewelry, you make sure that you add it as a writer to your insurance policy. Anything worth protecting needs boundaries. After I had my annual Grinchy, I hate Christmas moment on the couch with my husband, he said, that's it. He said, next Christmas, we are not leaving the house under any circumstances after we pick up the kids. And then he started early. He started in January telling our parents, preparing them that we were going to change how this system worked. He helped me by setting up a boundary saying, you know, we're not leaving the house for Christmas. You're welcome to come over here if you want, or we can do Christmas on another day. But for our family, it's just too much. Uh, and it was really casual that next year. It was so fun. Our pa my parents and siblings, they came over in the morning. Then my in-laws came over in the afternoon. And you know what? It was a really great Christmas. It was a really great day. And what was fascinating to me is afterwards, when we talked to our parents a little bit more, they both said how much more relaxing it was for them too. Establishing and maintaining healthy boundaries, it can be really hard. It can be one of the most challenging things that we do, and I want to acknowledge that. But it can also be one of the most rewarding things that you could possibly do. Jesus says this, love your neighbor as yourself. Friends, you have to love yourself in order to love your neighbor. You have to love yourself in order to love your family, to love your mom or your dad, your spouse or your kids, your step parents, your siblings. Basically, biblically, it's a prerequisite. You are worth protecting. Okay, here is our holiday survival guide. Number one, control what you can control. Number two, lower your expectations. Number three, boundaries. And number four, probably most importantly of all, remember that God has got you. When you're wondering how you're going to survive, when you're wondering how you're going to get through this next thing, how you're going to get through the family drama, how you're going to get through the exhaustion, when you're wondering how you're going to be in that challenging family member's space again, and when you're wondering all these things, wondering how God is going to make it for you to be able to get through, start by remembering God's promises, how God promises that God has got you. How God made barren women into mothers. How God parted the Red Sea in order to save all of God's people. How God tore down the walls of Jericho. How God healed the blind. How God fed thousands of hungry people. Remember how God raises the sun every morning and the moon each night. How God makes wars to cease and reunites loved ones after many, many years. How God has chosen to love you and how God even conquers death for you. God keeps God's promises and God has got you in and through, over, around, under, and up, above, among everything. God has got you through your entire life. God has got you. Because God doesn't just want you to survive the holidays. God wants you to thrive through the holidays. 
So today to close, I wanna share with you the serenity prayer. It's often used at recovery meetings and sometimes it's put on note cards or magnets that's probably over on your aunt's fridge. And, and usually we only use the first half of the serenity prayer, but I wanna offer to you the beautiful depth that is the whole thing. It's this reminder that God has got you. God's got you through all of it. God's got you through the holidays. God's got you with your family, through everything for every minute of your entire life. God has got you. Will you please pray with me? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as you did the world just as it is, not as I would have it, and trusting that you, God, make all things right if I surrender to your will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you in the next. Amen. You can hold my hand when you need to let go. Can be a mountain when you're feeling valley low. I can be a street light showing you the way home. You can hold my hand when you need to let go. please pray with me the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Okay, everybody, I'm gonna actually add a fifth thing to our holiday survival list. Number five, go to christmaswithcalvary.com. We are so excited to celebrate Christmas really big here at Calvary, and we want you to be a part of it. So go to our website, christmaswithcalvary.com, and check out all the ways that you can get involved with Calvary this Christmas season. As we close our time together, we're gonna to close with a time of generosity. We're so thankful for you. It's because of your generosity that we're able to do all of these incredible events to usher the holidays in, in the most fun way possible. There are four ways that you can give and they are on your screen. The first is that you can go to our website, calvaryalex.org and click on the button that says give. The second is you can go to Venmo. The Venmo handle is on your screen and give that way. The third is that you can write a check and mail it to the church at 605 Douglas Street, Alexandria, Minnesota, 56308. Or the fourth is that you can call the church with the number on your screen and we'll help you figure it all out. Hey, go thrive through the holidays. Bye-bye.